All right, we'll get going. <clears throat> so welcome in. Thank you for joining the webinar this evening. My name is Grant Price. I'm the head guide for Blue Ridge Mountain Guides. And <clears throat> with me, I've got Mark Vanover and Casey Dietrich. <clears throat> to start off, I uh, just want to talk a little bit about Blue Ridge Mountain Guides, and then we'll uh, <clears throat> go through some introductions of us and jump into questions. So BRMG is a year-round guide service during the <clears throat> um, summertime. We operate Rock in Virginia, West Virginia, and North Carolina. And then during the winter, um, we have a ice and uh, ski program in New Hampshire. <clears throat> We're pretty much full spectrum. Um, we climb uh, with folks that have never been out into the mountains before. Um, as well as folks that are just getting into it and uh, want to learn the skills to be proficient and get out on their own. Um, <clears throat> and then also with uh, folks that are looking to do higher end technical skills or ob objective routes. So uh, with that, Mark, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Grant. Um, first, I hope everybody is uh, safe and healthy and as is their families that's uh, out there listening to us. Uh, my name is Mark Vanover, and uh, I've been climbing about 40 years. Uh, I've been pretty fortunate to uh, have climbed in all disciplines, rock, ice, alpine, uh, expeditioning. Uh, I did do a little bit of guiding back in the 90s, but I had another professional career, and when I was guiding, that basically took away from my personal climbing. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, retire a few years ago, and uh, I've been working the last few seasons uh, for Grant and Blue Ridge Mountain Guides uh, down south. I actually live in New Hampshire. I come down a couple weeks every month uh, during the summer season. And then obviously, as Grant has said, uh, we run a ski and ice program up here in New Hampshire. So that's my backyard. Awesome. Uh, and I'm Casey Dietrich. Uh, I've been working with BRMG for a few months now. Unfortunately, that has been stimmied by um, the current crisis. Uh, but before that, I was teaching with Earth Treks out of their Crystal City location and through their outdoor program for the past three years. Uh, super stoked to be here. I've been climbing for most of my life, which is not nearly as long as Mark has been climbing, uh, but climbing is my passion. It's, it's always been there for me. Um, like Mark, I, I come back to it now and again, and uh, really getting into guiding and instructing has been uh, really inspiring to get to know people who are getting into climbing or who are in the climbing community and just want to learn more. So I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you. And PC, I think wins for the uh, best placement of the uh, mountain guide manual um, on the bookshelf. That's pretty well done. <clears throat> Yeah, so with that, um, if folks want to start shooting some uh, <clears throat> questions our way through the Q&A box, um, you can find the button for that at the bottom of your screen. Um, also, just looking at the attendee list here, I know quite a, a few people here, and um, with this small of a, a group, I'm uh, comfortable like turning folks' audio on. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to ask a question, uh, over audio as opposed to the Q&A box. If you just click the uh, raise your hand button, um, I can unmute you and, and you can speak. So while uh, waiting for questions to come in or hands to, to go up, um, one topic that <clears throat> I'm kind of interested in, in unpacking a little bit with um, everyone here, um, panelists and attendees is just crowding at the crags. Um, this has been something that's kind of ramping up um, and, you know, I'm curious to see what's going to happen once restrictions start to get lifted with COVID-19. Anybody have any thoughts on that, Mark or Casey? So I, I think is what's going to happen is once the uh, restrictions get eased, that it's essentially going to be a floodgate to the crags. Um, at least in regards to uh, one of the sport climbing areas up here in New Hampshire, meaning Rumney, which is uh, actually closed right now through uh, the USDA and the White Mountain National Forest. Uh, obviously, one of the most popular sport climbing areas uh, on the East Coast, if not the country. There's like 1,200 sport climbing routes. And, um, you know, I, I just think that 
you know, typically it's usually crowded. And I think even more so once these COVID-19 restrictions get eased or lifted. And, you know, I don't know how it can really be uh, policed, so to speak. And I just think it's going to be up to individuals to make certain they socially strain as far as uh, how they how they act around the, the crag and things like that. I think that's a great point that Mark makes. It's really up to us to modify our own behavior. We can't control everything. We can't control this crisis. We can't control others, but we, we can control how we act, how our group acts when we get out. If you have a, a good fortune of being able to get out, you know, midweek or during less peak times, that might be a better way to kind of avoid exposure to larger groups, but it really is on us to make sure that we're not overwhelming the system. One thing that I've been somewhat rigid about this year um, with scheduling, and this was all prior to COVID-19, was um, larger groups. I've been trying to just go out with larger groups of people during the uh, middle of the week. Um, I've pretty much ceased the idea of getting out with, you know, eight to 10 people with multiple um, climbing instructors on a, a weekend. Um, <clears throat> other things is, I'm, I'm trying to go to less popular areas more and more often. Um, I used to think that, oh, you know, we can fit at Pilot Mountain, and now I'm starting to head over to Moore's Wall um, more so, and I'm trying to unlock terrain that I didn't previously use for, like, top rope days. And I'm, I'm hoping that those things will not only help, help with just the general crowding, but also how we're gonna manage social distancing once restrictions start to lift with COVID. Um, so <clears throat> we can come back to that um, topic later as well, I guess, but we've got some questions going here. Um, does anyone wanna take this first one? We can probably all give just a, a brief take on this because we all have somewhat different setups. Yeah, sure. I'll answer it. You know, for me, as you know, you and I have talked, Grant, um, you know, I'm living a dream. Um, you know, I sometimes think that if I had become a climber before I had a professional career, that my, my life would have been completely different from what it was. Um, but it was what it was, and I have no regrets. Um, you know, climbing has been the one constant in my life for 40 years. And, you know, being retired now and being able to be a, a guide and an instructor, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great stuff. Um, you know, with that said, it's not easy work. Um, obviously, the winters are a lot harder than uh, standing around outside on an 85 degree day. Um, but there's a lot of satisfaction in being able to work with people and give them the day that they want. Because I think in, in, in the end, um, it really comes down to understanding what the guest wants to achieve uh, in his outdoor pursuit and a day of climbing. And then, you know, we all do our best to make sure that they get that. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had a, a difficult time. I think I am like a younger Mark in the regard that I have another career outside of guiding and constantly trying to balance my personal climbing, um, guiding and instructing, and my regular nine to five um, is a constant balancing act, but I love it. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, each part of my life affects the others in a positive manner. Um, so honestly, Guiding has been nothing but uh, a benefit to adding that to my life. I've been, been doing it, instructing for the last three years, and it has really increased my, my personal climbing um, capacity, the ability, uh, confidence, and uh, like Mark mentioned, being able to get people out there, get them stoked, get them involved. It's uh, really been great. Yeah, for me at this point, I feel like I've gone through different phases of the, the guiding life. Um, I certainly started out just trying to get enough work to kind of make it um, all go together for summers. And then uh, I kind of fought having a uh, traditional career and I think I've finally gotten to a place where <clears throat> I uh, have a good balance of guiding days and then office work, things like that. Um, that being said, like my full time guiding in the field has been mostly like single pitch um, climbing or at Seneca Rocks. Um, I haven't done any like full time guiding out west. I've always had this office component. Um, so that I think helps um, 
for me to not be just totally worn out all the time. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, I see a lot of folks that are, you know, moving into the latter part of their guiding career and they're heavily involved with organizations, um, you know, working with the AAC, working um, with the American Mountain Guide Association. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking maybe that will, will be a future phase of my guiding life at some point. And so coming through the, the chat window, it looks like um, folks as participants may not be able to see the, the questions. Um, so I'll read those out. Um, I apologize for that. Um, but that first question was, um, what is life like as a guide um, for the three of us? The next question is, <clears throat> is there any advantage to using the Alpine butterfly versus an overhand or eight when traversing with multiple people and attaching in the middle? Yeah, I would say that the <clears throat> overhand is going to be your go-to and some of the, the merit there is that it's quick to tie, it's easy to untie. And what that's going to allow you to do is change up the spacing between people um, efficiently. Um, <clears throat> one instance of this uh, might be like on a glacier where you're going from short roping mode to um, crevasse um, travel mode and you need to space yourselves out. Um, so the overhand is just gonna be a little faster for um, tying and untying. Um, figure eight, you know, really the only shortcoming there is that it's uh, gonna take a little bit of dressing to have a, a neat one. And then with the Alpine butterfly, that, that would be fine as, as well. Um, <clears throat> I can't really come up with any shortfalls to, to the Alpine butterfly or the eight. Casey or Mark, do you all have any thoughts there? Just what, you know, from my perspective, the uh, an overhand's just easier to tie but I don't think there's any detriment to using any of them. Cool. The next question is thinking about going through the SPI course this year. I'm trying to train my best at home during this time. Any cool ideas uh, for at home training specific to priming for this course? You know, what I would say is uh, if you don't have the uh, uh, SPI manual, make sure you get a copy of the SPI manual. Uh, read it front to back. When you're done, read it front to back. And then when you're done the second time, read it and just make sure you practice as many things as you can at home. Um, and that will certainly help you. Um, if you get an opportunity to find a mentor, that's something you can do outside and would be great. If you can't find a mentor, um, but you have a pretty steady partner, you can always go outside and work together. But I would always uh, have, the, have the manual handy with you. That way you can always reference it. I agree. The SPI manual has some really kind of nuanced, interesting tricks in it that we wouldn't necessarily come up with on our own or through regular instruction. So really having that memorized would be, would be ideal. And I mean, table leg, um, setting up anchors, working through those problems that you think you might experience with the SPI, familiarizing yourself with the crag. If you are able to get out to it and the crag that you're looking to take the SPI at, that would be helpful. Um, I know that uh, Seneca Rocks, they have an SPI exam there. Uh, but I don't necessarily climb single pitch there. So familiarizing yourself with routes that you may not be as familiar with at the crag that you're looking to take it at, that might also be helpful, mountain projects or whatnot. Yeah, and so on that note with the, the manual, that would be my recommendation as well. And this is the, the text that we're talking about. We include these on any of our SPI courses. And if somebody um, was signing up for a course during this time um, and they wanted to get access to this, um, I could actually mail you one of these 
um, ahead of time for the, the course. Um, I think I've got enough packaging material to send out a few from my home office space without having to go to the, the post office and you know, risk contamination and everything. <clears throat> Another resource would be videos. Um, to take the SPI course, you need to become a professional member of the American Mountain Guide Association. Um, there's an annual membership fee. I think it's around $80. Um, once you do that professional membership, um, you're going to get access to members only tech videos. Um, there's only a few for single pitch instructors specifically, um, but there's just some really good general content on there um, that will be applicable to you for the SPI program. That's a great question. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? Right. Next question is, uh, any suggestions for marketing yourself as a guide to get more clients when you're not into social media and hyping your name? I'd say talk very loudly at your climbing gym about climbing outdoors and your certification. You might get some more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's a good question, but I think it really comes down to, uh, you know, being active in social media. Um, you know, we look at what, what you do, Grant, and then uh, we know of others. And I think those folks that are pretty active on social media are the ones that kind of get uh, thought of front and center when people are looking that go outside and are looking for a guide or a guide service. I uh, <clears throat> can speak from experience that we see very little return on going to um, climbing festivals, um, things like that, and being a vendor or um, teaching technical clinics. Um, occasionally, there's some turnover. Um, I think it's you know good for the climbing community and, and worthwhile, and we'll continue to do it. Um, so maybe something to consider. I don't know how fruitful it would be. Another thing that you could do um, outside of social media would be um, rack cards. Um, yeah, if you can find you know, outdoor minded businesses um, <clears throat> or climbing gyms that don't necessarily have a outdoor climbing program, so you're not gonna be competing, um, making some rack cards just for yourself or even just a business card and uh, see if you can work with those businesses and uh, get your, uh, your materials there, that could really help. Um, we do actually see a, a decent amount of uh, clientele come in from uh, paper marketing at climbing gyms and, uh, and such. Yeah, I've actually just got them like right on the desk, um, small business cards and then uh, rack cards and you know somewhat social media style i think the, the photography should be good um that's a big facet of it casey mark you all have any other thoughts there i've i've always got uh a brmg rack card in my pack when i'm when i'm climbing a couple of them in in uh business cards um, because you never know the conversations you might strike up when you're at the crag, just climbing personally. And I always hand those out. Um, surprisingly enough, and, and um, you know, I've, I've got the uh, BRMG sticker on the back of my truck, along with the AMGA sticker and the accredited business sticker. And uh, that actually drives a lot of conversations in parking lots, especially because I'm up north uh, a lot. And, and people see that and want to know what I'm doing up north. <laughs> I'd say it also um, depends on what type of business you have and what type of business setup. If you're guiding under a group like we are guiding under BRMG, obviously it would like pertain more so to grant 
running the business and kind of his guidance. But if it's just you trying to work through that, I mean, there's a whole other slew of things that you need to take care of if you're guiding on your own. Um, but yeah, I think that that's something to keep in, in mind as well. And that's a completely different piece of the equation. Yeah, permits, insurance, things like that. That's, that's a big <laughs> part. Um, I'll uh, give a plug here to 57 hours. Um, <clears throat> newer company that serves as a platform for booking um, climbing adventures um, and other mountain activities, whatnot. Let me share my screen and I'll show you their page. So there's the uh, <clears throat> 57 hours site. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and guides can pretty much set themselves up on uh, this platform with trips and uh, their availability and everything. Um, so another avenue, um, something that um, we just did was I put together an article on uh, Seneca Rocks. Um, <clears throat> just some beta on the area. I think um, meaningful content that folks are interested in goes a, a long ways. Um, again, with the, the photos, I think uh, having a, a good camera and like having a little bit of photography skill is necessary. <clears throat> so it might be something to work, uh, check out there. Um, and then yeah, maybe try to start creating content and you could probably post this um, outside of social media channels. The next question is cordelet versus three um, or like three shoulder um, length slings for anchors. Um, cordelet has been a gold standard, but triple length slings seem to be much lighter. Thoughts? So for me, I, I always carry cordelets, um, no matter what the terrain. However, if I know like uh, in, in New Hampshire, we have some um, multi-pitch bolted sport routes and I probably don't carry the cordelette there but I do carry a triple leg sling and use that as as a quad um, it's it's like you say it's super light it's super handy um, and it serves a purpose and um, you know sometimes ice climbing if it's a multi-pitch ice climb I may carry the, the triple length sling also but I've usually always got cordelettes with me same. I think that they both have different functions and I personally feel less hurt about potentially having to cut a cordelette than I do a sling. If I cut off a couple feet of a cordelette and leave that behind as a, a bail piece or something like that, it uh, feels a little bit nicer than cutting up that nice sling. Yeah, I would uh, just echo Casey's thought there on being able to leave behind cordelette. Um, it's a lot less expensive, and then you have the ability to untie it, put it around a feature, put in a wrap ring, um, and leave behind a you know, proper anchor for, for future climbers. Um, <clears throat> certainly, the, the sling material is going to be a lot lighter um, and more compact, subsequently a, a little bit more expensive. But then, um, because it's bar tacked, you have no way of opening this up and getting the, the full length. Um, and if you do cut it, if it's a uh, tech material like Dyneema, um, you're not going to be able to tie it back with a water knot as you would a nylon sling. That's something to, to think about. Um, that being said, I, I do find myself using um, <clears throat> you know, 3X and 4X length um, Dyneema slings, especially during the winter time. Um, where I'm going to be building ice anchors and uh, I want the um, water repellency of this tech material. Any other thoughts on that? Cool. Yeah, so if you have other questions, um, send them our way through the Q&A panel, or if uh, you want us to turn on um, 
the audio for you, just uh, find the raise your hand button, um, or you can send us a message through the chat window and uh, we can unmute you. Um, <clears throat> behind me, I've got a door that I can set up a master point from, um, so we can do some <clears throat> like at anchor demo of uh, tech skills, if that's of interest to folks. What would y'all say is your most prized climbing possession? Gear, jacket, sentimental value, expense. That, I, I, my climbing partners. That's more important to me than any piece of gear of my climbing partners. It's a great answer. Yeah, that's a tough one to follow. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, on the other end of that spectrum, I really like stuff that's pretty like cheap and disposable. Um, four foot nylon slings are great. They're really versatile. They're $9.95. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I probably use that for more um, things in the mountains than anything else. Nice. All right, we've got a question here. Mid-Atlantic style anchors generally. Some nice new shiny Z4s. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got the larger ones finally. I, I got the one larger one I was missing from the hall, yes. <laughs> the 0.75. Nice. Um, so mid-Atlantic style anchors generally teach bowling with an extra loop. Is there any added benefit to this? Um, can you give us a little more about what you mean with the uh, extra loop or Mark or Casey, do you follow that? Does he mean a bowling on a bike? I think he might mean a double bowlin versus a single bowlin. Maybe. Oh, maybe for a tie-in knot you're talking about, Casey. For the tie-in or I tie a double bowlin around trees frequently. Okay. Um, and where you could use a single, however, the friction with a single is not as sufficient as the, the friction with a double. All right, Sean, um, your audio is opened up. You'll just need to unmute yourself on your end. Hey, can you hear me? We can. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, um, I was just asking for clarification. Casey knows exactly what I mean, but uh, just the Mid-Atlantic we teach, um, a lot of schools teach when you tie around a tree, you wrap, put an extra lap, wrap around your bowen and poke back through. I've heard mixed reviews whether this adds strength or um, kind of why that seems to be in vogue in the mid-Atlantic and uh, just curious your thoughts on that. Oh, interesting. Um, so this would be with like a single bowling around a tree as opposed to a bowling on a bite? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, <clears throat> I can't say that there would be any like significant benefit there. It seems like people might be going for trying to get a bit of a like tensionless wrap effect where you're not putting force on the knot itself. Um, or maybe they're, they're thinking that that's going to disperse the force on the tree, um, you know, more gradually or more dispersed, so less damage to it. Have you, you heard any oh, thoughts you, on it, Am Sean, I still on? Sorry, uh, sorry, I didn't know I was still on. Um, more, not necessarily wrapping the tree. It's so when you do a bowling, you basically put an extra loop, you know, um, and then when the rabbit comes up the hole behind around the tree back through it, you basically got an extra uh, okay. wrap there. Yeah. Okay, I'm with you now. <clears throat> yeah, I've researched um, bowling testing recently. And I'm just not seeing a lot of numbers out there as far as failures one way or the other. Um, I think some people think that doing that extra wrap is going to um, make it a little less prone to uh, loosening itself up through cyclic loading. <clears throat> and within the SPI provider pool, I've seen that from really only like a small number of providers. Um, I would say most people are not doing it. 
So Great. Sean, Thanks. I've I've never seen anybody use it as an anchor, but climbing at Rumney a lot, I see people use it as a tie-in, do the double loop bowling. Um, but I, you know, in New England, I've never seen anybody uh, use that from an anchoring perspective. Perfect. Yeah, I just uh, there's a couple of schools that have had that come through the mid-Atlantic for a while and I've never got good clarification on why. So um, thanks. Yeah, do you, do you know if there's any correlation there with um, Sean Taft Morales? Or sorry, Sean, uh, yeah, I got that right. Yeah, uh, Sean TF. Yeah. I, I honestly don't know if Sport Rock, I know Earth Treks Outdoor School has taught that way as well as REI. Um, and it's just a common thing you see uh, around the crags at Card Rock and Great Falls. Um, and I've had some dialogue with some staff um, and haven't got good clarification as to where that originated from. The reason I asked about um, Sean TF is that uh, I've mostly seen it out West, um, specifically with um, AAI. And I was wondering maybe like Sean um, brought that from out west. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, good question. Thanks for bringing that up. All right, Sean, I'm going to go ahead and mute you again. Next question is, um, would we mind reviewing how to load one stronger or um, anchor over another anchor um, point when building an anchor using your door crag? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna take a moment to get that set up. And then if folks wanna ask other questions, um, by all means, and uh, I'll be right back in a moment. So, Mark, have you been able to get out much at all recently before uh, any shutdowns? No, not really. Um, there is kind of a local secret crag about 20 minutes from my house that uh, I did get to last week and clipped a few bolts. But uh, other than that, m most of the uh, typical climbing areas, um, um, you know, they're a couple hours away. And um, like I said, with Rumney, which is a great place to go because it's all bolts for the most part, um, it is closed. So, you know, for me, uh, my activity has mostly been mountain biking. Um, in my town, I have some good conservation area with a lot of trails. And like I said, uh, I did get out once last week to do a little bit of cragging. How about yourself? I have not been able to get out much in the last you know, month and a half or however long this has been going on. Uh, unfortunately, the last time I was able to get out actually was uh, up kind of your way, uh, Mount Washington. Um, I went up with a group of friends. and Nice. When did you come up to Mount Washington? Uh, Mid-February. Okay. I think. Or Martin Luther King Day. What's that? I think it was Martin Luther King Day. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Was, we, uh, had, we, we had a, a pretty, time. we had it. we had a pretty busy season. Um, I was pretty busy from the beginning of December up until the end of March. Um, so this respite has actually been pretty nice to kind of let the body heal, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. It can be a lot on your body. <laughs> Summer, winter, guiding multiple days in a row, a lot of caffeine. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to answer this question. Um, is there any reason to use semi-auto crampons versus auto if using a C3 boot? Uh, I see some people still using a front to back strap when they don't need to. And I'm curious about that. So um, some of the um, crampons are completely automatic, obviously. And then we have some of the ones that are semi-auto. So you've got the uh, heel and then you've got the sort of uh, plastic toe bail where you still use the strap that goes from the heel lever up through the toe bail. Um, th those are great from a perspective of um, 
I, I'm going to say expeditioning or if you're in a guide service. So from a guide service perspective, um, sometimes people bring their own boots and it might not have a front welt. So having a semi-automatic crampon, um, you know, is, is good from being able to like easily fit it. Now, my first comment was from an expedition perspective. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, automatic crampons, no matter how well you fit them, can come off. And I think if you look at a lot of like pictures and videos, um, you'll see a lot of people that are on big mountains that um, are, are using crampons that don't have a front toe bail, but have the, let's call it the, the semi-automatic um, front toe connection and then still have the strap. Um, from a, a personal perspective, uh, I, I can relate to um, back in probably the early 90s, uh, I, I had a, uh, a buddy of mine that was a climber and he had gone to do a uh, first winter ascent of a 7,000 meter peak in the Himalaya in Nepal. And they unfortunately had a death on the trip because someone was having problems with their crampons and thought that they had been fixed and weren't going to fall off anymore. And they were descending a uh, fixed line and the person came off the fixed line at the bottom. And when he came off the fixed line, he was standing on pretty benign terrain but his um, crampon came off again and he actually fell into a crevasse and that was it. So I, I think a lot of times when, you, when you're in that type of situation in the mountains, big mountains, um, those semi-auto crampons are pretty beneficial. Hopefully that answered the question. And one thing I'll add to that, um, <clears throat> was that, um, you know, there's also strap on crampons and those can be nice for Alpine objectives where you're actually intending to climb in a approach shoe or an approach boot. You can get some really lightweight, um, aluminum or, um, <clears throat> steel or even a hybrid with a uh, steel toe piece and a, uh, aluminum heel piece that will go onto a Gore-Tex uh, mid-top boot or a uh, approach shoe and allow you to cross a snow field and, and then ditch those and be in uh, sticky rubber for the majority of the route. So to me, it, it kind of comes down to actually having a large selection of crampons. Um, <clears throat> you know, in my gear closet, I've got a ton of footwear ton of crampons, lots of different ice tools and axes, um, and then ropes and backpacks. That's kind of the majority of my quiver. All right, so we'll go back to the, the question on the anchor. Um, what I've got rigged up is a bolt board. And Mark, Casey, on your end, how well can you see that? Do I need to move the computer? Closer? No, I, I think that's pretty good, Grant. Okay, so we're going to rig a top rope anchor here. So we'll use locking carabiners all around because it's gonna be an unsupervised anchor. And <clears throat> there's a variety of ways to re-engineer the load of the anchor once We've constructed it and quote unquote equalized it. So let's start with shortening one of the two legs. Easy way to do that would be to come up and just add in a wrap. That's going to make one leg shorter, one leg a little longer. Once that stretches, they'll be. Uh, in tune if you're thinking of them as uh, guitar strings and then that's going to direct more of the force onto the, the left bolt there. So that's one option. Um, you could do <clears throat> all kinds of variations of this. For example, putting in a, a clove hitch or using a smaller carabiner on one side than the other. If you have some foresight that you want to distribute the load as you're rigging it, we can change the rigging and double up on material on one side. 
One thing that I'll do on a bolted anchor where I can go through a rappel ring or a mallion is what I call the Z rigging. So I've <coughs> connected my cordelette and I've doubled it up. And then on the ring, I'm gonna pass it through, come back down, and then tie my master point. Just gonna run out of material, lengthen it up. All right, so now we've got two loops on one side and then a single on the other. So this is gonna put more force onto the double loop side. Got more material there. There's gonna be less elongation, so more force is gonna to go to that left one. Yeah, Casey, uh, Mark, any other ways that you all like to redistribute load? Mm. Not that I can think of offhand in regards to anything different than what you've shown. That's the primary, yeah. And on a bolted anchor, um, <clears throat> oftentimes you're gonna have two strong bolts and this is kind of unnecessary. One application of the Z though on the bolted anchor would be to save a carabiner. Say you get to the top of the pitch and you're running low on hardware, um, you can emit one carabiner this way. A uh, shortcoming to it is that you've now um, taken up one of those rappel rings. So if you're on a multi-pitch climb and people are going to try to rappel past you or cl um, climb past you, um, you've maybe gotten in the way a little bit. Um, this could be applicable though if you came up to a stance where one bolt was better than the other one and you're concerned about that. So the uh, next question here is in regards to crowding at the crag, um, <clears throat> Pat likes the uh, folding sign that I uh, bring and use uh, to mark our territory. Um, yeah, so what uh, is being referred to there is a crag along the Blue Ridge Parkway called Raven's Roost. It's a, um, a pull-off climbing area, basically. The parking lot's on top of it. So there's quite a bit of traffic from non-climbers and there's really no signage to um, discourage people from throwing objects off the top of the cliff. Um, so yeah, we have this fold out sign that we put out um, right above where we're climbing to hopefully deter people from throwing rocks or at least as many rocks. <clears throat> okay, is anyone guided? more out west or in other countries and how does that compare to guiding in the U.S.? Differences with uh, clientele, terrain, trips, etc. Mark, do you want to maybe just speak to the, the northeast and then I can talk about um, my time out in Utah? Yeah, I mean, um, obviously from a standpoint of terrain, um, for the most part, you know, terrain out west is, is significantly bigger. So back here in the east, um, while we do have some pretty good long multi-pitch climbs uh, in New Hampshire, in uh, the Adirondacks, and then down in North Carolina and even places like uh, Seneca and West Virginia, um, you know, I, I, I think we just deal with different scenarios uh, from that perspective. Um, most uh, of, of even the big long routes uh, in any of those areas have relatively um, have less commitment from an approach perspective. So, you know, you can um, still be relatively close to home for the night, so to speak. Whereas, you know, if you're, if you're happen to be in Wyoming, you know, and you're going into the Wind River range, it's, you know, as far as clientele and things like that, I, I think, you know, people that want to go out and have an experience in the mountains, um, need to choose the right guide and guide service. 
and that will enable them to, to, to get out of the day what they want. Like I said before, it's, it's a lot of guiding is understanding what the guest's objectives are for the day and making certain that we do the best as guides to uh, make sure we meet those objectives. Yeah, um, I've spent, uh, I guess, around like two um, plus winters out in Utah. And um, while I was out there, I did a little bit of rock stuff in Southern Utah. And then I bounced over to um, Red Rock for a, um, an SPI program to work with another provider. And then the majority of the time I was uh, doing mechanized ski guiding um, with a snowcat operation. And <clears throat> I guess some, some differences, um, certainly <clears throat> bigger terrain, um, a lot more diverse terrain. And then as far as the people you're climbing and skiing with, um, not a whole lot of difference. Um, I think the, the clientele on the East Coast is pretty diverse in terms of experience. Um, out West, maybe um, you are going to be out with people that have been climbing and skiing overall a little longer. Um, I think they're ahead of us culturally in terms of, uh, you know, being a mountain community. Um, and, you know, it's been really exciting to see the East coast grow in the direction where we're heading. Um, a lot more people are, are into mountain sports, um, in the mid Atlantic now. And then um, one thing I, I will say out there is that permitting can be really challenging. Um, so for people that are trying to guide independently, that can be um, next to impossible in some areas. Um, <clears throat> and then with that, the guide services tend to, to be a bit larger. Um, so a bit of a difference if you're going out there to work as opposed to being on the east. Yeah, Casey, you have any thoughts on that you want to add? I have unfortunately not guided out west or in other countries, but I have climbed in other countries um, without a guide and really, really, really getting to know the lay of the land, um, picking up any language phrases that you can. It's very helpful. Uh, frequently, they're not using Mountain Project. They're using something else like Camp to Camp or some random guidebook that you find in a hotel with drawn pictures of where the anchors are. Uh, so really trying to figure out how to best plan your trip. And I think that holds true regardless of where you're going. If you're climbing in Italy, if you're climbing at Seneca, or if you're climbing at Great Falls here in Virginia, um, really planning out what you need to do, um, how you get a hold of local authorities should something go wrong, how you signal someone, really all of that needs to be taken into account when you're planning a trip, whether you're just guiding or climbing on your own. Yeah, I guess one detail I should mention too with international stuff is if the country's mountain guide association is a member of the International Federation of Mountain Guide Associations, um, there may be a minimum standard of credentialing that you need to work in that country. Um, especially if um, you're a foreigner coming there. Um, so for example, you know, somewhere like France, um, as a U.S. guide going there, um, I think you would have to pretty much be an IFMGA guide um, or have created some pretty formal relationship with a company there to maybe work under um, one of their pinned guides. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so comment from uh, Sean here. This is a, a really good thought with putting up signage if you're a climbing guide or instructor. Um, a lot of these land use permits do have stipulations that you can't um, advertise in the park. So you can't put up your, uh, your rack cards, your business cards in the park. Um, I'd say that the slate, uh, I don't even think it's a gray area really, but reason that we usually don't have concerns at Raven's Roost is that um, the permit actually specifies that it's highly likely that people will throw rocks off the, the top of the cliff. Um, so I think the, the National Park Service is pretty content with us putting the, uh, the sign up there in that case. Okay, so a second question on the anchor. Is there a way to load more 
on a stronger side of an anchor when using a variable load anchor, such as a quad, thinking in terms of using um, protection instead of bolts. And so let me think about this one for a, a second. Um, I'll build an example here of a, a three-point anchor with a quad, and then we can talk through uh, some points there. And while I'm getting that set up, uh, if anyone has other questions, by all means, go ahead and type those in or uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand virtually there and we'll unmute your audio. The three point quad was gonna be my suggestion as well. Okay, Casey, I'll ask you a question. Where's your favorite place to climb? It's hard. Uh, I love all climbing, frankly, even if it's just putzing around here at Great Falls. Um, Seneca, I, Seneca, but I do also really love the gunk. Um, yep. Gorgeous up there. So, what, is, what is the coolest place you've climbed or the most foreign? Um. So places like Bolivia and Peru uh, from an expedition perspective, and I, and I did a lot of, not a lot of stuff, but I started going down there like back in the mid eighties. Um, so it was pretty wild. Um, not a lot of people went down to Bolivia to, to climb or even Peru from that perspective. Um, so that's, that's probably been some of the most unique places I've climbed, um, but every place is unique in regards to, you know, what the climbing's like. Um, I mean, I, I love the Black Hills of South Dakota for rock cragging in places like Joshua Tree and City of Rocks, but then you can go to Yosemite and it's completely different, or you go to the Canadian Rockies or the Bugaboos. So, you know, it's all unique, but from an experience perspective, uh, my first trip to Bolivia in 86 was pretty eye-opening because it was really my first time out of the country um to a different culture and it opened my eyes up to just how different things are but how things are really the same yeah what were what were some of the immediate challenges when you when you went there language um um for me yeah the first time i went down there were eight of us and it was like four people from let's call it the mountain states and four people from back east here um got together like there was there was a common friendship between those two um a couple of the people had been down before so from a logistics perspective um we, we had a little a little bit of heads up in beta and kind of knew what we were supposed to do once we got down there um the first time i went down sort of as like a smaller group and being on my own you know my my spanish even to this day is not that great and getting around was a challenge but um you know the, the the great thing about at least in in, in Spanish speaking countries, um, you know I can I can speak my uh, my my really bad Spanish and they want to start speaking their really bad English and they come to something in between and you can figure things out. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So got a quad anchor set up here and we've got two strands going off to one piece of protection. And then I've split these other two over to uh, another two pieces of pro. And <clears throat> one thing that somewhat concerns me that I see people doing here is not necessarily thinking about the strength that we need in each side of the system. One thing with a <clears throat> self-equalizing anchor like the quad is that while we have these load limiting knots here to reduce the drop in the system, if one side were to fail, <clears throat> if we put a relatively weak piece or placement on this single side here, it wouldn't take that much to fail that. And then we get that drop or extension onto those other two pieces. Um, so if you're doing this, just be mindful that this single leg here is going to an adequately strong placement. And then if you had two, you know, maybe um, smaller pieces or two, we'll say marginal pieces 
Um, this could be a nice application, right? Running that uh, off to each one of those. In terms of actually distributing the load, <clears throat> it's gonna be challenging. The reality with equalization is that at best it's theoretical and at worst it's mythical. Um, in lab testing, we're just seeing that when the system's loaded, all of the force, or at least most of it, is usually going to one of the points of protection at a given moment in the loading. Um, so ways to, to possibly put more force on the one side. I don't have anything um, <clears throat> terribly great for you. The only thing you could um, consider is the length of these legs. If I could make one of these really short, I potentially would have more force going to that shorter one. Um, but again, um, equalization kind of mythical. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I would recommend is just try to go with significantly um, strong points. So you don't have to worry so much about the equalization. And then <clears throat> if that's not possible, then start thinking about how can we distribute the load to our better pieces and the quad may not be the, the best tool for that. So there's a question, Grant, uh, sort of a follow-up to I think when Casey and I were talking about climbing in other places and uh, to, to answer that from my perspective, um, I'd still like to get to the Himalaya. Um, you know, I had a professional career and I had an opportunity to do like four big expeditions, but they would have basically meant giving up my professional career. Uh, could have gone to Pakistan to climb uh, G2 in Broad Peak, uh, the Pamirs to climb Kantengri, Shishapangma in China, and then Ama de Blom in Nepal. But every one of those was like, yeah, let me give up my job and my career and come back and see if I can resume my career. And as much as climbing was, was important to me and has been, um, you know, pretty much my entire adult life, I just never made that decision to actually do that. So, you know, I'd still like to get to the Himalaya maybe someday. Some of my uh, upcoming climbing destinations are very similar uh, challenges regarding balancing expeditions versus career and how to take time off. Um, unfortunately, my regular nine to five isn't super forgiving regarding month long climbing vacations. Um, but I would like to get out to Rainier hopefully within the next year. Um, and I'd like to get back to Italy. Uh, I climbed in the Italian Alps um, this past year, and it was amazing. The food also was amazing. <laughs> yeah, trips for me. Um, I need to spend more time on glaciers. Um, it's something I miss out on being in New Hampshire during the winter and then down here in the mid-Atlantic for a long rock climbing season. Um, so yeah, I want to get um, to Pacific Northwest and then um, yeah, maybe over to Chamonix in, in France. <clears throat> Does anyone want to talk tandem repels? No. <laughs> no, as, and I don't need to talk about it because I, I just don't do them. I don't believe it's any quicker. No, I'd say pre-rig the rappel and just keep going. Yeah. Yeah, in the mid-Atlantic, the terrain here is relatively short. Um, and it's oftentimes kind of contrived. We're not just going easily from bolted anchor to bolted anchor um, without having to like do some, you know, swinging around, um, traversing, things like that. And uh, yeah, I, I don't find that it's really worth it. Um, <clears throat> on bigger terrain with two very proficient climbers, maybe you could uh, make it a little more efficient. Um, <clears throat> you certainly want to manage the risk of tandem repelling. Um, there have been accidents from this. Um, a great article that gives you some tricks on uh, how to be more efficient and secure um, is out there by the American Alpine Club. I believe uh, Ron Plunderberg um, authored it. Um, if you Google around, you can probably find that and um, I think that's a, a pretty good uh, piece. The only time I've ever had to do a tandem rappel is climbing in the needles in South Dakota. There are some of the needles that you absolutely have to do tandems to get off of.
All right, so a question here. Any tips for leading um, two or more people up? Um, rope management has always been a, a bear there. Um, <clears throat> so two or more people, let's, let's just say that you're with a, um, a group of three total. You know, your first rope technique is caterpillar. So you're gonna have a rope from the leader to the second and then from the second to the third. And <clears throat> with that, it's gonna, you know, not go terribly fast because you're gonna have one person at a, a time climbing. Um, <clears throat> however, that's gonna be possibly the easiest to start out with in terms of rope management. Um, Mark or Casey, either you wanna talk a little bit about kind of the next step there with parallel. Sure, yeah, I've uh, done quite a few kind of parallel having two followers at, uh, at Seneca and also ice climbing um, here and there. Uh, ice climbing is a completely different story, but climbing a multi-pitch rock, it depends on your followers. It depends on their experience level. If you can get them to help out as much as possible to be responsible for their side of the rope management, for their side of taking it out of that rat's nest, um, which inevitably happens almost every time. That has been uh, a good way to have me have my followers grow as climbers, own the responsibility, uh, have like have them feel like they're helping out. That's really kind of my first uh, tip in that regard. In terms of the the ease of running parallel ropes, um, your equipment is quite important. Um, you want to have thin ropes, you know, something on the order of like nine to 9.5 millimeters at most. Um, and then for a blade of ice, you might consider something with a larger aperture, more rounded um, <clears throat> edges to it. Um, a Kong Gigi is a, a great choice. And then with parallel, bear in mind that there's some risk um, with that system in terms of people penduluming into each other, knocking off rock on the person below them. Um, and then if you're not familiar with keeping the ropes together at the blade of ice, there's a way you can inadvertently split the ropes and possibly defeat the auto blocking nature of the, uh, the blade of ice. Um, so certainly wanna be up on that stuff. And uh, <clears throat> if you had more than two people you certainly could do caterpillar and still just climb one at a time, or you might do a hybrid of parallel and caterpillar. So I might lead in parallel with two people behind me and then off of one of my like second and third um, climbers, I might have a rope going to that third person following me. And then once the people in parallel come up the pitch, um, I'll start bringing up that last person in, in caterpillar. Um, and yeah, you know, it's a cool social outing to, to be out in that large of a group in multi-pitch terrain um, in terms of like the amount of effort and the amount of climbing you all are going to get in. Um, I'd say, you know, maybe the value is not necessarily there. Uh, but if, if you're looking for more of the social day, um, it can be really cool to have a bunch of folks going up a route like that. I'd also like to mention, I think it's really helpful to your fellow climbers not within your group to pick a route that's not particularly popular or maybe not do something like that on a really nice weather weekend day um, if you're caterpillaring like three people behind you and you're hanging out on one of the classic routes uh, you might I don't know develop a little bit of bad will there Yeah, it's kind of a theme, huh? The, the crowding issues um, that we're having to manage in our community and at the crags. Awesome. So um, <clears throat> getting to the um, 835 here. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, appreciate the questions. Um, appreciate you coming out. Um, excellent to have everyone. And uh, let us know if you have other questions. Um, you can contact us via email. I'm um, happy to try to um, <clears throat> send you photos or video of any like technical skills, um, things like that right now. <clears throat> and then um, 
just reading a last comment there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, awesome. <clears throat> so with that, um, yeah, thanks again, and uh, hope to see everyone out at the crag soon. Have a great night, everybody. Be well, stay healthy. And what I'll do <clears throat> is just manually close these out.